This Torah class is brought to you by TorahAnytime.com. <clears throat> okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, we're already about a week before the Yom Tov of Hanukkah. And this is a shira that's been percolating in my mind for many, many months already. And I've been uh, chalishing to give it over. And I think we're within a week, so I'm entitled already to speak about the Yom Tov of Hanukkah. Now when it comes to Hanukkah, we're all familiar that there are two miracles that we commemorate. The first miracle, of course, is the miracle that the Gemara Masech the Shabbos, and Daf Chafal from the Beis, the Gemara asks, my Hanukkah, what's Hanukkah? And the Gemara goes on to say that there are eight days of Hanukkah that we don't eulogize, we don't say Hespedim, we don't fast, because when the Greeks enter the Heichal, they... They sullied, they dirtied, they made tame all the oil in the heichal. And when the Malchus Beis Chashmanoim prevailed, they're searching, searching, searching for oil. All the oil has been rendered unfit by the Yivanim. And finally, miraculously, they find one jug of oil, which is only enough to last for one night. And it lasts for eight days. Everybody knows this is a miracle of Hanukkah. There was only enough oil to last for one day, and it lasted for eight days. Okay, very good. However, if you look in the Alanisim, Alanisim, of course, is the insert that we add to the Shemona Esrei and to the Berchus HaMazayin on Hanukkah. And by the way, you should just know that even though if you forget Alanisim, you do not have to repeat Shemona Esrei, but you should know that if you forget Alanisim, you really blew it. You know why? Because the Gemara says, what's Hanukkah? Hanukkah are days... Behalel v'hoida, days of halel and thanks. What's the thanks that you do on Hanukkah? That you say al anisin. That means the whole yom tif is to say al anisin. So if you daven shmon and you don't say al anisin, you missed out the yom tif. Like, like you didn't have a yom tif. It's like a sukkis without a lul of an esrei. That's Hanukkah without al anisin. Yeah, you don't have to repeat shmon esrei. It's just you blew the concept and the inyan of hoida. The way we thank Hashem for the miracles by saying Alanisim. Okay. Now, if you look in the Alanisim, Vimeim Atasio Ben Yochel and Kain Gadol, and I'm going to give you something extra that's not on the sheet, no extra charge. You don't have to pay extra for this. In the Alanisim, there are a hundred and either twenty-four words in Alanisim or hundred and twenty-five words in Alanisim. Why? Because it was written by Yochanan Kain Gadol. Yochanan is Begematria one twenty-four. So therefore he wrote a tefillah either with 124 words, says the Kalbai, or with 125 words because he wanted to show anivos, humility, that the tefillah has one more word than the numerical value of his name. But if you look in the Alanisim, the focus of the Alanisim is the military victory. That it was Rabim biyad ma'atim, the many in the hands of the few. It was Temeim biyad tahirim. Tzadikim defeated the Rishayim. The Alanisim focuses only on the fact that we won the war. There is no mention whatsoever in Alanisim about the finding of the jug of oil and the fact that the jug of oil lasted for eight days. So it's very uh, interesting, very interesting, that in the Gemara we only focus on the miracle of the oil. There's no mention of the military victory. And in the Alanisim we only focus on the military victory and there's no mention of the fact that they found the oil. So you say, okay... There are two miracles of Hanukkah. One miracle is the military victory. And one miracle is the fact that they found the jug of oil and it lasted for eight days. It's very unusual to have a Yom Tif that commemorates two different miracles. Pesach, we left Mitzrayim. It's one thing. Sukkot, we sat under the clouds. Shavuos, we got the Torah. You don't have a Yom Tif that there are two miracles. And if you think about it, these two miracles are have nothing to do with each other. They're almost completely unrelated. One is, we won the war. One is, we needed oil in the Beis HaMikdash, and we couldn't find any, and we found one drug, and it lasted for eight days. But somehow, the Yom Tif of Hanukkah is the fusion, is the combination of these two miracles that would seem to have nothing to do with each other. The military war, a military war, even if it's unlikely that you're going to win the war, but somehow you could construe it, you could somehow rationalize and explain it that, you know, even though they were more than us, we outsmarted them, we outmaneuvered them, we outschemed them. But the oil was a complete 
miracle. I mean, if you only have enough oil to last for one day, there is no way to explain how oil could last for eight days. And yet, it's like we take these two miracles and we celebrate both of them. How do these two miracles, so to speak, work together? How could they explain, be explained as one common idea? Okay. Another question that we want to deal with, look at number three. The Mishnah says in Perkei Yavai's Parakei, Mishnah Zayin. Asara Nisim Nasu Laviseinu Beis HaMikdash. There were ten miracles that happened to our forefathers in the Beis HaMikdash. Okay, that means if you were to go into the Beis HaMikdash any day of the year, you would pr- possibly see one of these miracles. Number one, Lohi Pila Isha Meireach Besar HaKodesh. A woman never miscarried when she smelled the meat in the Beis HaMikdash. We know that a, a woman who is expecting... She could have a strong uh, craving for certain types of food, and if she wants it, you got to give it to her. Even uh, the Mishnah says in uh, Mishnah, uh, Mishnah Masech Yuma, I happened to be learning this Mishnah about three minutes before the Shir with my son. Mishnah Masech Yuma, Parik Ches, Mishnah Hey. I was just learning this Mishnah. It says that if a pregnant woman smells meat on Yom Kippur, you give it to her. Why do you give it to her? Because if you don't give it to her, it could be... It could be life-threatening. No woman ever miscarried by smelling the meat in the Beis HaMikdash. And the meat in the Beis HaMikdash never rotted. Never rot. Right? So let's say, tonight we have good food. I mean, this is, this is real meat. This is not like, you know, regular. This is real basar. Basar. Yeah. But the thing is, if you leave it out here for another few weeks, it's not going to smell that good. Right? Yisrael, it's not going to smell that good. Right? So, Unless you have a cold, then you can smell it. Yeah, but it's not, it, the bus is not going to smell that. In the base of things, the bus could be left out for mo- not, nothing and never rot. It never spoiled. Nothing ever happened to it. And there were no flies in the base of Mikdash. Yeah. You ever go into the Shlach Toys? <laughs> the, the butcher store? There is Vuvim. There are flies everywhere, right? In the base of Mikdash, there are no flies. Now these are, and then the, the Mishnah says, the Kain Gadol never became Tameh. The rain never put out the fire on the Mizbeach. The wind never blew the column of smoke. The, even though it was cramped, it was full, it was, it was crowded, everyone had enough space. And yet none of these miracles are ever celebrated. You ever, you ever have, is there any day on the calendar? Let's say, you know, on the 23rd day of Teves, you get like 10,000 Jews to crowd into a shul. They say, what's going on today? Oh, today is the Yom Tiv to commemorate the fact that in the Beis HaMikdash, even though it was crowded, everyone had enough room. No such thing. You don't commemorate that miracle. Is there any day of the year that we like bring meat into the shul and, and everyone starts smelling it to see if it's going to rot? Oh, this day commemorates the miracle that the meat didn't rot. We don't have any such day. Is there any day of the year that um, you know, we bring fans in to see if it's going to blow the column? There are many miracles that happen to make some English every single day and none of them are really worth commemorating. So then why, just because they found one flask of oil that lasted eight days, big deal. I mean, these type of things happened every single day in the Beis HaMikdash. Every day there were miracles. Can you imagine? There was a column of smoke that emanated from the Mizbech, it went straight up, and despite the fact the wind was blowing from the east, from the south, from the north, it did not affect the column of smoke. That was every single day. And there are no Yamim Taibim of... Straight column of smoke, yamtif. There's no such yamtif. So why all of a sudden you find a little flask of oil and it lasts eight days? I mean, come on. In the scheme of things, it seems to be very insignificant. Here you have miracles that last 410 years and nobody says boo. All they get is one little Mishnah and Perkei Avais. And the miracle of the oil, it's eight days only. What's eight days compared to 410 years? And all of a sudden we make a whole big deal about the miracle. The Pnei Yeshua... Pnei Yeshua is one of the great Achreinim, one of the great sages of the last few hundred years. Pnei Yeshua asked the well-known question, and that is, everybody knows that Rebunisham, that God likes to remain behind the scenes. He likes to remain behind the scenes. What does that mean? That even though, right, if you put your hand over your heart, you feel your heart pumping, right? Who's making your heart pump? Rebunisham. Does the Yibbana Shalom come to you and, and like, you know, when you, wake, when you wake up at night, you see the Yibbana Shalom like pumping your heart? No, he doesn't like to be known. He doesn't like anyone to know he's there. So even though he's pumping your heart and he's making your lungs 
expand and contract. He's doing it. God is doing it. He doesn't want us to see Him. He wants everything to seem natural. God does not like to change nature. If He doesn't have to. So here the Jews come in. They don't have any pure oil. It's no problem. Use tummy oil. Use impure oil. There's a famous rule that's called Tuma Hutra B'tzibor. That means when the majority of the Jewish people are tummy, they've come into contact with a dead body, they're allowed to bring karbonis. So they're allowed to do the avoid and the Beis HaMikdash. Why would Rebani Shalom have to allow us miraculously to find one flask of oil and that flask should last for eight days? Who needs it? We don't need the miracle. Use Tame oil. Tuma Hutra B'tzibor. You know what Tuma Hutra B'tzibor means? That if the majority of the Jewish people are Tame, they could still do the Avoida. So you say, yeah, but it's still better to use pure oil. No, it's not. It's not better to use pure oil. The Gemara says in the Sechta Psachim that there's a machloikis whether we say Tuma Hudcha B'tzibur or Tuma Hutra B'tzibur. It means the following. Do we say that if the majority of the Jewish people are Tame, then we sort of waive the prohibition? If it's just pushed off, then maybe it's better to use pure oil. But if it's Hutra, Hutra means we completely dismiss any prohibition. That even though ordinarily, if you're Tameh, you can't do the Avoida, if the majority of the Jewish people are Tameh, the Isser, the prohibition of Tuma, is completely dismissed. It's Hutra. And if Tuma is Hutra B'tzibor, it's not even better to use pure oil. So if it's not better, why is God troubling Himself to make a flask of oil that would ordinarily only last for one day, last for eight days? Why is Hashem bothering Himself? Let us use tame oil. What's wrong with tame oil? It's nicer. No, it's not nicer. Not if Tumah is Hutra B'tzibor. So the whole miracle is not needed. God doesn't just make miracles to show off. God doesn't need us to recognize Him. He, he only does it if there's a need. So if He only does it, there was no need for the oil to last for eight days. That's the famous question of the Pnei Yeshua. Okay? Another question you could ask is that, what were the Jews thinking? Why were they even looking for pure oil? The Greeks came in, they ransacked the place, they destroyed everything, they smashed everything, they defiled everything. There were probably thousands and thousands of flasks of oil in the, in the base of Mikdash. We'll see, they purposely went after the oil. Why were the Jews even searching for the oil? What, what were they looking for? What were they searching for? Why would they even think they would find one flask? I mean, you know, the halacha is that once there's one dead body in the base of Mikdash, the whole, all the oil is tamay automatically because of Tomas Oihel. So even if they would find one, it would have to be in a way where it's not even under the canopy of the base of Mikdash. I mean, it's like, imagine if you came in here tonight and you see me, and what am I doing? I have, you know, one of these metal detectors. And if you know, you know there's medical on, this, on the shore, you, sometimes you see people, you know, with the metal thing. And you say, Rabbi, what are you doing? I'm looking for treasure. Really? Yeah, I think in the times of George Washington, somebody left a treasure somewhere in this area. Yeah? You might decide to go with a different share of this tonight, if you saw me doing that. Why would I be searching for a treasure in the shul? Why were the why were the Hashmonam? What were they looking for oil for? Why would they even dream that there'd be oil in the Beis Hamikdash? Okay. And finally, this is one of the most stimulating questions, one of the most challenging questions when it comes to Hanukkah. This is really a remarkable question, and this is a general question about any time the Jewish people are in danger. We always have two options. Yeah. <laughs> We could either go to war, we could all either fight back, man our army, fight, or we could run to the shul, say to Hillam, and do tshuva. What should a Jew do? A Jew is in danger, a Jew, the Jewish people are being threatened. What should our reaction be? Should you fight, or should you do tshuva? Well, or should you do both, or should you do neither? Says Rabbi Hanan Basaman, we have two Yamim Taivim, Chanukah and Purim, and by each one of these two Yamim Taivim we find different reactions. So, first of all, by Chanukah, 
The Jewish people were being threatened, religious persecution. They tried to abolish Shabbos. They tried to abolish Miwa. They tried to abolish Rosh Chodesh. What was the reaction of the Jewish people? Do we find that, uh, anti, um, that Yochanan and Matasio put up signs, everyone gather in the shuls, fast, and Davin, we don't find such a thing. No tshuva, we don't find they did tshuva, we don't find they fasted, we don't find they repented, we don't find, you know what we find? War! They armed themselves, and they attacked back, they fought back. Even though it was hopeless, and even though there was no shot really, they would win the war, and even though Rashi and Vizoy Sabracha says, that there were only a dozen people fighting. There were only 12 people fighting. Still, they felt, they poskined, the correct thing to do is, you got to fight. Melchanes mitzvah. War. That's the correct Jewish response. And yet in the times of Purim, when Haman made his diabolical decree to annihilate the Jewish people, do we find Esther said, all able-bodied Jews gather now and fight against that Haman guy. We're going to destroy Amalek. <clears throat> no. Do we find Mordechai getting up, saying to all the Jews, donate all your swords and your spears and your guns, and we're going to fight? No. We find one command. Leich kenois as kol hayehudim hanimsam v'shushan. Gather all the Jews. V'tsumu alai, and fast. V'al toichelu. Don't eat. V'al tishtu, don't drink. Shloishas yamim layla v'yam for three days. We don't find any fighting. We don't find any armed resistance. We don't find Jewish, uh, Jewish resistance. None of that. Shuva, Tfila. Right? He cried out. He screamed out. He did Shuva, Tsaaka. So it's very interesting. By Hanukkah, we don't find they did Shuva. We find war, Melchama. And by Purim, we don't find any war. We find tshuva. Ask Rabbi Hanan Vasserman, when do you fight and when do you do tshuva? That's a good question. That's a very fundamental question. Because that's a question relevant in every generation. We're always through B'chol dar v'dar o'im dimaleinu v'chaloiseinu. They're always coming against us to destroy us. When do Jewish people fight and when do you do tshuva? That's the question of Rabbi Hanan Vasserman. In the Sefer, Koivetz Ha'arais. Okay, Rabbi Yisrael, if anyone asks you, what's Rabbi Hanan's favorite kasha? You're going to tell them. His question is, why by Purim did they fight? No, why by Purim did they do tshuva? And Chanukah, they fought. You'll know. You'll know what to tell them. That's the kasha of Rabbi Hanan. There's a well-known Levush. The Levush writes, that there's another fundamental difference between Hanukkah and Purim. How do we celebrate on Hanukkah? On Hanukkah, there's no mitzvah to have su'uda. There's no mitzvah to have mishteh. The main obligation of Hanukkah is to thank Hashem and to say halal. That's why on Hanukkah we say full halal all eight days. We celebrate spiritually, right? Everybody knows that. On Purim, on the other hand, we don't celebrate spiritually. There's no, we don't say halal on Purim. We say, it's mishteh v'simcha. Yeah, we have a big suda and we drink. We celebrate physically. Why on Hanukkah do we celebrate spiritually? And why on Purim do we celebrate physically? And everybody knows the famous explanation of the Lavush. That on Hanukkah, they were not trying to kill us. The Yavanim did not want to kill us. The Yavanim wanted to have us as loyal subjects. And like any invading army... They want the loyalty of the conquered nation. They said, look, we're going to protect you as long as you submit to us and give up your religion. They said, no more Shabbos, no more Mila, no more Rosh Chodesh, no more Kriyas HaToyra, no more Mezuzah. So it was religious persecution. So if they only want to take away your religion, so when Hashem saved us, how do we celebrate? We celebrate religiously. We pray, we daven, we say halal. But on Purim, if, Ham, if we would have said to Haman, Haman, no problem, we'll convert to your religion. Haman said, I don't care what you convert to, you're dead, I'm going to kill you. Haman was not trying to take away our religion, Haman was trying to destroy Gufenu, our bodies. And therefore on Purim we celebrate physically.
right? Everybody familiar with that? On Purim, the decree was against our bodies. We celebrate physically. On Hanukkah, the decree was against our nefesh, our neshama. We celebrate spiritually. But now let's take it one step further. Okay, that's what you came here tonight. You knew this before. This is where, this is why you came tonight. Let's take it one step deeper. Why on Hanukkah did Hashem allow our enemies to try to take away our religion? And by Purim, Hashem allowed them to attack us physically. In other words, I know what the Goyim were trying to do. On Hanukkah, they were trying to religious persecution. Take away Torah, take away mitzvahs. And I know on Purim, they were trying to annihilate us physically. But why? Why in one place did Hashem allow the Goyim to proclaim one type of decree? And why by Purim and Chan- did Hashem allow them to, to proclaim a different type of decree? What's the reason? What's the cause? What's the Siba? So for this, Rabbi Yisai, we have to see number eight. Number eight, the comment of the Bach, the Bayis Chadosh, Bayis Chadosh, Rabbi Yoel Circus, one of the first commentaries on the tour. Says the Bach, a very fundamental understanding of Hanukkah and Purim. Okay, you ready for this? If you never learned this Bach, then you never understood Hanukkah and Purim. And I say that very confidently. In order to understand Hanukkah and Purim, you must know this Bach. Says the Bach. Again, on Purim, they try to destroy our bodies. On Hanukkah, they try to take away our souls. Why? Says the Bach. It's because of us. It's because of something we did. Number eight. Look in the Bach. Says the Bach. What was the Avera that the Jewish people did in the times of Purim? They had pleasure from the meal of Achashverosh. Mordechai told them, don't go to the party. I don't care if it's kosher. I don't care if it's OU, Badatz, Chavke, OK. I don't care what the heck sure is. You can't go to the party. The Jews went to the party. They went. They didn't listen to the leaders of the Jewish people. The Avera was, we had illicit physical pleasure. They were nene from the Suda. Ah, oh, if the sin was, they had physical pleasure. How are they going to do tshuva for that sin? The only way to do tshuva for illicit physical pleasure is you have to refrain from physical pleasure. What kind of tshuva did they do? They fasted for three days. They fasted. The only way to do tshuva is to fast. Listen carefully. What was the sin? The sin was their bodies had pleasure. So therefore Hashem said, your body sinned. I will allow Haman to make a decree to exterminate your bodies. Your bodies sinned. Mida kenegen. Mida, the decree will be against your guf. How did we repair that? How did we rectify that? We refrained. We, we refrained from physical pleasure. We fasted for three days and three nights to correct the masakein, the fact that we were nene from the Surah Hashem. So when Hashem saved us, He saved our bodies. And therefore when we celebrate, we celebrate physically with Mishta Vesimcha. Okay? Got it? I call it the Bach's five-step approach. The five-pronged approach. The Avera was, we had physical pleasure. The Gezerah, the decree was, physical annihilation. The Tshuva was, physical refrain. The salvation was, physical salvation. And therefore the Yom Tov, the celebration, is a physical salvation. And now here's where the Bach tells us the key to Hanukkah. But on Hanukkah, what Avera did the Jewish people do that Antiochus was successful in making the decree to take away our religion? The Avera was, says the Bach, very important words. Al shehisrashlu ba'avoida. They slackened off in their service of Hashem. In other words, the Avoida, the service in the Beis HaMikdash was done, it was performed, but it was lackadaisical. It was... It was lazy. It was without energy. It was that without enthusiasm. It was nisrashel. It was behisrashlos. It was weakened. 
it weakened, it slackened off. Maybe the Kohanim came a little bit late. Maybe the Kohanim did it in a little, a little bit groggy. But they slackened off in their Avaida. And Hashem says, you're slackening off in the Avoda? You think you're doing me a favor when you, when you do my service? You don't want to do it? Don't do it! I'll take it away completely. I'm giving you an opportunity to do the Avoda in the Mesa Megdash. But if you're, la- if you're lazy, and you don't do it properly, and you don't do it with enthusiasm, you don't do it with energy, you're not doing me any favor, so you don't want to do it? Forget the whole thing! So you know what the punishment was? Says the, uh, says the Bach, because they were lazy and they were in Israel, the decree was the Greeks came in and closed up shop in the Beis HaMikdash. Because God says, you don't want to serve me. You don't want to do Avaida. No problem. We'll close it down. I don't need it. Don't do me any favors. I don't need your favors. If you don't do it the right way, don't do it. I'll take it away from you. And the Goyim were successful in doing two things. They closed down the Beis HaMikdash. They stopped the offering of the carbon Tamid. And says the Bach, there was one mitzvah specifically they were after. And that is they had a tradition that so long as the Jewish people light the menorah in the Beis HaMikdash every day, we're undefeatable. We're, they cannot overcome us. So they went into the Samikdash with the mission to defile every last flask of oil. That was their main tafke, that was their main objection, objective. Because Hashem says, if you're gonna be lazy, I don't need your favors. Forget the whole thing. That's the pattern. So the Avera was spiritual Avera. The punishment was spiritual punishment. So how are you going to do tshuva? How are you going to correct that? If the Avera was, we're lazy in doing the service of Hashem, how are you going to correct that? There's only one way to correct it. You have to show God you're going to give up your life to regain and restore the Avoid and Beis HaMikdash. How do you do that? You go to war. You have to fight a war to regain and restore the Avoid and the Beis HaMikdash. And that's what they did. They went to war. They risked their lives to say, look, we were wrong. We weren't doing the Avodah properly. We were a little lazy. But really, 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 we really need it. We really want it. And they risked their lives to regain the Avodah. Oh, Hashem says, you're going to risk your life to regain the Avodah. I'll give you the Avodah back. I'll give you Karbonis back. I'll give you the Menorah back. I'll give you oil back. And therefore, when we celebrate on Hanukkah, how do we celebrate? With Avoidas Hashem, Lahalel. Right again, the Bach has the five step approach. You have over here at number nine, a new Maramakim that we never featured before. This is a Torah journal. It's called Hama'ar. From Tafshin Ayin, Kislev. Tafshin Ayin is when, exactly when Kislev, it's on page Lamed Zayin. And this is a summary of the Bach. The five steps of the Bach. You got it? The five steps of the Bach are, what was the Avera of the Bnei Yisrael? The Avera was, we were in the Srashel Ba'avoida. We slackened off in the Avoida. We slackened, we were lazy. What was the punishment? God says, you're going to slacken off? I'll take it away. Don't do me any favors. Close down the base. Mikdash. All the oil is gone. How do we do tshuva? We do tshuva by risking our lives by jeopardizing our life to restore the Avoid and the Beis HaMikdash. And then when Hashem sees we're willing to risk our lives to restore the Avoid, Hashem gives us the Avoid as Hashem back and therefore we have to celebrate by serving Hashem. So it occurred to me that according to this Bach we're able to answer the question of Rabbi Chanon Vassarman. Again, Rabbi Chanon's Kasha, listen carefully, this is Beautiful. Kafter v'ferach. Right? With the menorah. Kafter v'ferach. Rebbe Chanan's kasha. Was why by Hanukkah did we fight a war? And why by Purim did we do tshuva? Did we fast? According to the Bach, it's very simple. It's very clear. By Purim, the Avera was illicit physical pleasure. So how do we do tshuva? You have to fast. What are you going to fight a war? Who are you going to fight against? Your stomach? You're going to you're gonna take a... You're going to take a knife and attack yourself? What? That's not a good Eitzah. 
If the Avera was illicit pleasure, the only way to rectify that is got to fast for three days. But in times of Hanukkah, what was the Avera? The Avera was, we were lazy, we didn't care about the Avodah and the Mesa Mikdash. Well, the only way to correct that is you have to show God that the service of Hashem is meaningful to you. You have to show Hashem you're not misrashal in the Avodah, you're willing to risk your life for the Avodah. That's what I would like to suggest to answer Elchanan's kasha. I was very pleased to see that there's a sefer that came out this year called <coughs> Yarach Hamayadim of Rabbi Rucham Oshin, the Rashiva of Lakewood. And he, in one of his Mamarim, he gives the same answer to Rabbi Hanan's Kasha from the Bach. That according to this Bach, there's a very clear answer to Rabbi Hanan's Kasha. But what I would like to explore this evening is this principle of the Bach. Listen carefully to this principle. That there are certain patterns that a person could see in this world. And that is, Hashem says, if you're going to do, I gave you Avodah Hashem. You could come and daven to me. You could come and do mitzvahs. If you're, yeah, you're going to do it. You're going to daven. But if you're going to be in this Rachel, you're going to slacken off. So even though it looks like you're doing it, but if someone says, don't do me any favors. You don't want to do it. You don't like doing it. It's too hard for you. Well, you've chosen this path. You don't want to do it. I will remove from you the opportunity completely. That's a certain pattern that the Bach is identifying. That when the Jews slackened off, God said, don't do me any favors. You don't want to do it. It's like, you know, your parents ask you to do something, and they have to ask you 50 million times, and finally you do it, and, you, and it's, oh, you're huffing and puffing. They said, don't do me any favors. I don't want to. You don't want to. I'm asking you to do me a favor. You don't want to do it. I, then don't do it. But there's a certain pattern in life that the Rebbe Shem gives people opportunity. And if you don't take advantage, you could lose the opportunity. And let me explain. I want to extrapolate and explain this a little bit further. There's a Sefer called Sefer Melachim. Yeah, the Book of Kings. One of the books of Tanakh. The very first Pasuk in Sefer Melachim says, Vehamelech David Zakein. King David became old. Baba Yamin. They try to cover him in clothing. It didn't keep him warm. So here you have David Amach. He's an old man. He's shivering. He's cold. He puts on his jacket. He puts on his coat. He puts on his blanket. He puts on his heating pad. It ain't working for him. Why not? I mean, either clothing keep you warm. Clothing keep you warm. Rashi brings down from the Gemara and Brachas. Kol hamevaze begadim. If you disparage clothing, enoi nene mehem lesayf. You will not get benefit from them. We find when David Hamelch encountered Shaul, he acted toward clothing in a disparaging manner. He took his sword and he cut off the corner of Shaul's beged. The Gemara considers that that David did not treat clothing with the proper respect, and therefore when he became old. Clothing did not keep him warm anymore. See, what kind of... Whoa, 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 it's crazy. Clo- I mean, it's a scientific phenomenon. Either clothing... Wor- How do clothing, yes, work or don't work? Either they work... No. If you respect something, then that item will work. If you don't respect something, that item will not work for you. If you respect davening and you daven, your tfilos will work. If you don't respect tefillah and you daven, you know, well, hey, how come I learn and I'm not reaching high levels? Well, it all depends how you treat something. If you value something, it retains its value. If you don't value something, it can only be as effective as what you consider it. That's a principle in the physical world. That if you value clothing, they work. If you don't value clothing, they don't work. And it occurred to me, a very interesting explanation for a Mishnah in Perkei Yavais. Look at number 13 for a moment. The Mishnah says in Perk Dalet, Mishnah Gimel, Al tihi vaz l'chol adam. Don't look down on anyone. Don't look down on anyone. <clears throat> Why? Shein l'cha adam, shein l'cha. Everybody has their hour. In other words, sometimes you see somebody, who is this guy? 
he's a schlepper, he's a, he's a la yitzlach. Eh, in your mind, you, like, you write him off. He'll never do anything. Says the Mishnah Perkei Avais. No. Don't, don't undervalue any human being because everybody has their role and their time to shine. That's the simple meaning of the Mishnah. But maybe you could say a little bit deeper. Every person in this world has a role and has a time to shine and could be of service to you, could help you. Don't look down on them. Because if you look down on them and you don't value them, they will not be effective for you. The same way David did not value clothing, the clothing didn't work for him. If you don't value every human being, one day you're going to need this human being. He could help you, he could save your life, he could rescue you, he could do a taiva to you. But if you don't value him, he's not going to be effective for you. You can't benefit from something that you don't value. Maybe that's what the Mishnah is saying. But if we could expand this idea a little bit further, then in life in general... There are certain patterns. Sometimes you see somebody and you wonder, how in the world are they able to accomplish what they accomplish? And sometimes you say, how in the world did this person get so far? Or whether it's for good or for bad, whether it's successful or not successful, what happened? There are certain patterns. For example, the Mishnah says in Pirkei Avos, if someone fulfills the Torah in poverty, here you have a guy, he's not making ends meet, it's hard for him to pay the bills, he has a lot of distractions, it's hard for him to put food on the table, it's hard for him to make it, and even so he persists, he persists, he persists, he doesn't let anything distract him, he learns, he makes sure to always learn. So God says, oh, you want to learn? You, this is important to you? I'll give you more money. If you choose this path, and you choose to value learning, even when it's difficult, the Rosh says, fine, so I won't make it difficult, I'll make it easier for you. You don't need the difficulties. You, I see you really want to learn, so I'll take away any impediments. But on the other hand, someone who's, let's say, very wealthy, that means very comfortable, nothing distracting him, nothing getting in his way, nothing interfering. And even so, he, he doesn't focus on what he needs to do. He lets small things get in his way. So the Rosh says, if you're letting small things get in your way, I'll give you big things to get in your way. <laughs> why, why use poor excuses when you could use good excuses? There's certain patterns in life. There's certain progressions. There's certain laws of the universe that all you need to do is put your best foot forward. Once you put your best foot forward, the Yom allows the progression to take you further, whether it's for good or for bad. Or the Mishnah says in Perkei Avais, in Batalta Minat Torah, this is number 14, Mishnah Yudbeis, if somebody allows small things to interfere with his Torah study, so your person's able to learn, nothing on the schedule now, nothing getting in his way, and instead he just twiddles his thumbs and just lets the time slide by. So God says, if you're going to be Mavato from Torah, I'll give, you, I'll give you real reasons to be mavata. I'll give you real things to get in your way. There's certain patterns in life. Certain progressions. This is what we call God leads you in the path that you wish to take. Whether it's for good or whether it's for bad. God prods you along. You say, what? How did... Uh, how did this Talmud, how did Rav Moshe find, how did he learn so much? It's impossible. Answer is, you're right, it is impossible. It's impossible. How did Rav Avadi Yosef, how did he learn so much? It's impossible. You're right. Granted. Maskin. It is impossible. But if a person really wants something, God says, that's what you want? It's not impossible for me. I'll bring you there. I'll take you there. Bederech sha'adam roitzeh leilech leilech and I say, and the path you want, what you really want, God helps you on that path. Came across one of the most astounding midrashim you'll ever hear. Okay, it's a good story. You ready for this? Israel, you ready? Yesterday. Yeah, listen to this. Once upon a time, there was a shikr. You know what a shikr is? A drunk, yeah? And this guy loved alcohol so much, he sold everything in his house to buy alcohol. 
First he sold, his wife came home, she said, where's the dining room table? Whatever. It's under control, it's under control. <laughs> next day, the next day, the dining room chairs, everything's under control. Come, the next day, the shower is gone. The next day, the next day, uh, the fridge, the freezer, the beds. And then finally she had enough because her shoes are gone. And what's going on? What's going on? The guy sold every last article in the house to buy schnapps. The son said, I can't take any more. What's, what's dad going to leave for us in the Yerusha? So they decided to teach him a lesson. They got him drunk, and they carried him out, and they put him in six feet under in the Beisak Faris. So the guy's lying there in a drunken stupor. Meanwhile, a caravan is passing by. And the caravan just so happens to be selling wine and schnapps and bourbon, everything you can imagine. And all of a sudden they hear a noise. There's a war in the city. They drop thousands and thousands and thousands of bottles right next to his kever. And after three days he wakes up and he says, Gan Eden was even better than they told me. <laughs> and there's a bottle right by his head. And he takes the bottle and he drinks. And he, he had more alcohol than ever. It's a medrash. Medrash number 16. Vayikra Rabba, Parsha Shmini. A few days later, the kids say, let's go check up on our father. They go into the base of course. They said, this guy, he's pulling, I don't know what. Somehow he always gets what he wants. So they, they said, there's no way around it. They made up a system that every day of the week, one of the kids will supply the tata with wine, with alcohol, and... That's the end of the story. Says Rabbi Leo Dessler, Mechda Melio, what in the, what kind of medrash is this? This is, you know, medrash for alcoholics. What kind of medrash is this? What's, what's the medrash trying to teach you? The medrash is teaching you the principle of B'derech Sha'adam Roitzel Lelech Ma'ilich Benaisai. On whatever your chosen path in life is, the Yibbam Shalom assists you on that path. Even if it's for bad, and even if it's an alcoholic, the Yibbam Shalom, and it's not just naturally God assists you, the Yibbam Shalom will make miracles to help you do what you really want to do. So says Rebbe Leo Dessler, he is so shaken by this Medrash, because we all know God's attribute of Taiva is 500 times greater than His attribute of Ra. And if God makes miracles to assist a sinner to drink more alcohol, could you imagine what type of miracles God will assist a person if they really want to come closer to Hashem? This, this medrash should really shake a person up. Because it makes available to all of us. Siyata d'shmaya lemala lemala menatava. Unbelievable, miraculous, heavenly assistance. All you need to do is put your best foot forward. And the Yibam Shalom says, says Rebbe Yo Desa. This is what Chazal means. Pischuli Pesach Kechudoy Shomachat. If you open for me a hole the size of a, ni- a needle, Va'ani Yaftach Lochem Pesach Kepischa Shulam. Then I will open for you the size of a palace. But I'll do it. And when I do it, I could turn over the world. I could make miracles. I could change nature. Says Rev Dessler, if you could get alcohol miraculously lying in a grave, then extrapolate that 500 times how much God could assist a person who really wants to come closer. Says Rev Chaim Shmulevitz, I learned this principle from a different Gemara. Okay? Equally as stardom. The Gemara says, in Masechta Yuma, and that pay Gimel Amad Beis. <clears throat> there were three great Tanoim: Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Yehuda, and Rabbi Yosi. Ah, and Rabbi Meir had a practice. No, oh, don't go. You're gonna miss. You're gonna miss. No, no, no. Yeah. So, 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 we're almost done. Yeah, Rabbi Meir had a practice. Rabbi Meir had a practice. Rabbi Meir would look at your name, and he would analyze your name. So let's say your name was Ephraim. He would look at your name. Ah, oh. Habein Yakeli Ephraim. He would look at you and he would know all about you, yeah? But the other Tanah, they didn't pay too much attention to names. So, they were traveling. 
and they needed to go to a hotel. So they stopped off in uh, Hampton Inn, and they went to the innkeeper, and they said to the innkeeper, what's your name? He said, oh, my name is Kidar. The mayor said, Kidar? There's a Pasuk in uh, Devarim. Kidar tapuch is hema. Basically, Kidar means he's a bum. So he said, my name is Bum. So the mayor said, I don't trust this guy. The other two Tanam gave him the wallet. You know, they have the security box in the front. Of, they gave him the wallet. Ramirez says, you know, I left my wallet at home. <laughs> Meanwhile, it's coming Shabbos. What's Ramirez going to do with his wallet? He goes out into the cemetery behind the, the motel. Every good motel has a cemetery behind it. And he buries his wallet by the grave of the innkeeper's father. He didn't know it's the innkeeper's father. The innkeeper goes to sleep. And he has a chalam. He has a dream. And in the dream, all the way from the world of truth, the innkeeper's father says, You know what? Boy, do I have a gig for you. This Reb Mayer buried his wallet by my head. And it's really annoying. You know, I don't... When I wake up in the morning, I can't... It's not very comfortable to have that wallet near my head. Why don't you go steal it? The innkeeper goes and tells Reb Mayer about his dream. Reb Meir says, yeah, don't pay attention to dreams. Then Reb Meir makes a mad dash to the grave, and he stands over the grave until after Shabbos. Shabbos is over, and Reb, Meir, and Reb Yossi and Reb Yehuda say to the innkeeper, we want our wallet back. He says, what wallet? He says, Lo dvar I, you never gave me a wallet. Reb Meir said, hey, why didn't you realize this guy's a bum? He said, his name is Kedar. So Rav said, why didn't you tell us about this thing, that names mean something? Rav said, look, you always have to be suspicious. Ask Rav Chaim Shalevitz one simple question. The guy's father is in the Oilam Moemes, he's in the world of truth. He's coming from the world of truth to tell his son about a potential robbery? I mean, you would think when you're in the world of truth, you're above that stuff. Says Rav Chaim Shalevitz, in the path that you want to go, God will lead you. He'll send messengers from the Olam HaEmes to help you rob. So you, could, you wouldn't be... You, imagine if, you know, the police caught two guys robbing the bank and there were, the police are wondering, hey, why didn't the alarm go off? So they asked the thieves, they said the alarm didn't go off. Because our father in, in Olam Haba, he told us the code. I mean, that's what's happening over here. How is such a thing possible? That the Tata in Olam HaMS is coming to help out with us? The answer is that a person, once they choose their path in life, to whatever extent, they really desire something. God will turn over the world. He'll make miracles happen. He'll send alcoholics free supplies, lifetime supplies of alcohol in the base HaKvaris. He'll bring people in from the next world to help out. This is the principle of V'derech Sha'adam Reitzah Lelech Malich and Isa. And whatever path you want in life, God prods you along that path. This is such a fundamental concept that if you look in the Gemara in Makkah, Yudam Yudam Beis, the Gemara says, Min ha-tayra, min ha-nevi'im, u min ha-ksuvim, b'derech sha'adam roitza lelech, b'amoylech in Oisai. This is an oft-repeated theme in the Tyra. Hashem comes to Bilam. He says, Bilam, don't go! Bilam says, I want to go. God says, oh, you want to go? Go, gezun to hate. What's going on? Hashem told Bilam not to go. Yeah. But once Bilam wants to go, not only will Hashem tell him to go, He'll help him go. Now this is a very frightening thing. Because that means success does not demonstrate correctness. Just because you see a person successful, or you see an organization successful, or a movement successful, that has no bearing on whether they're doing the right thing or not. All it shows is, God takes you on the desired path. So I heard, in the name of Rav Ariely, who is one of uh, the great Magide Shurim today, Rav Ariely gives one of the most uh, well-known Shurim in the Mary Yeshiva in Yerushalayim. If you ever want to see 
like the Shechina on a person's face, you look at Rav Asher Ariyami. I had the privilege when I was learning in Chafetz Chaim in Eretz Yisrael. So he lived in the neighborhood of the yeshiva and he used to come down in Marav. And I was like, sometimes he would sit in the back. I was sitting next to him. He gives one of the uh, Swedish shiurim in the oil of my yeshivas. He said like this, a beautiful thought, an unbelievable thought. You ready for this? The Bach identified for us that why did God let, let the Greeks take away our service in the Beis HaMikdash? Why did Hashem allow the Greeks to close down shop in the Beis HaMikdash? Says the Bach, because the Jews slackened off and we were lax a days ago and we were lazy, God says, don't do me any favors. You don't want to do the Avaidah? Then just the whole thing is over with. If that's the way it works, for Avera, then al achas kama v'kama, all the more so, that if a person wants to do a mitzvah, not only will the Rav help them do a mitzvah, God will help them do mitzvahs that were physically and naturally impossible to do. So when the Jews slackened off, God said, close up shop. You don't want to do, you don't want to do the avod in the base of Mikdash. It's a burden for you. You'll lose the opportunity. But as soon as the Jews risked their life to restore the Avodah and the Beis HaMikdash, God says, oh, it's meaningful to you. Then not only will I give you the Avodah back, I'll give you Avodah that you don't need. You don't need Tahar oil. You could use Tameh oil. I'll give you Avodah that's physically impossible. You only have one day, I'll make it last for eight days. Because it all depends on where you're headed. When you're headed down, Rebbe Hashem says, way down. And when you're headed up, says God, you want the Avodah. You're risking your life for the Beis HaMikdash. Not only will I restore the Karbanos, I will give you back the Menorah in a way you don't need it. And you can't even do it. Physically. Imagine, the Jews found one flask of oil. They only found enough for one night. How did it last for eight, ni- eight nights? The answer is, once Klai Yisrael chose to value the Avodah and the Beis HaMikdash, once they chose to risk their lives for the Avodah, once they showed they're no longer going to be Misrashel, they're not going to slacken off, but they appreciate what it is, then God says, I'll give you even more than you're able to do, Badar HaTeva. There are patterns in life. If a person doesn't value the service of Avodah Hashem, Hashem says, I'll take away from you what you even have. And when a person values, and a person puts his best foot forward, and a person puts an energy, and the, the Jews risk their life to restore the Avodah Mesa Mikdash, ah, oh, Hashem says, now I'll give you Avodah even Lamala Menateva. So if you want to know, here you have two miracles on Hanukkah. One miracle is the miracle of the war. One miracle is the miracle of the oil. And you say, what do these two things have to do with each other? They seem like two disparate ideas, two unconnected ideas, two miracles that... No. Look how they work together. The fact that the Jews were willing to risk their life for Abba Hashem. So Hashem says, now I'm going to give you even more than you're able to do B'derach HaTeva. It's the other step of the... of the program. It's the other step of the pattern. The pattern, Lara, was how it all started. It started, they slackened off. God said, they slackened off. Close up shop. But what's the other extreme? The other extreme is Hanukkah. The other extreme is when you risk your life to gain the Avoidah, says God, not only will you get the Avoidah back, you'll get Avoidah Sashem Lamalo Menateva. Sometimes you see, Gedoyle Yisrael, it's miraculous what they're able to do. It is. No question. It is miraculous. It's a miracle. And every person has the opportunity to tap into the system. It's a system. That's the way the world works. It goes by your ratzon. It goes by what you really want. And if a person is able to muster real deep ratzon for Avoid Hashem, for Lima Ratzon, for Kiyam HaMitzvot, then the Rebbe Hashem not only will assist you to do that, He'll give you opportunity. That's the Neros of Hanukkah. The Neros of Hanukkah are the testament to the fact that when you really want something, Yubam Shalom will change nature and go above and beyond nature. So, I have a friend in Yeshiva. 
his name is Nachmi Luban, he told me a very uh, beautiful pshat that fits in very well with this. And that is on Hanukkah. What is the laning of the first day of Hanukkah? We know every day you lane the Nesim. But the, the, the laning of Hanukkah begins the following. It was the day Moshe concluded putting up the Mishkan. And Rashi quotes Chazal that asked, but Moshe didn't put up the Mishkan. Betzalel put up the Mishkan. Aliyah put up the Mishkan. Says Rashi, even though Betzalel put up the Mishkan, we credit Moshe Rabbeinu. You know why? Because since he was Moshe Nefesh to put up the Mishkan, he was... He gave it his all to understand what Hashem was teaching on our Sinai and to relay it to the Jewish people. Since he was Moiser Nefesh and he gave up of his life, he gave up of his existence for the Mishkan, we credit him with the whole job. Why do we lay that on Hanukkah? Well, that's what Hanukkah is according to the Bach. Hanukkah is the fact that the Jewish people, they were Moisar Nefesh to regain the Avoidah. The Rebbe Shem says, once you're Moisar Nefesh to regain the Avoidah, not only will I give it back to you, you'll have even more than you're naturally able to have. And one more thing. At the end of Shachris on Hanukkah, we say, what? David? Mizmar, Shir, Chanukas, Habayis? The David. Mizmar, a psalm, a song, the inauguration of the Beis of David. But one question. David has nothing to do with the Beis HaMikdash. He didn't put it up. Who put up the Beis HaMikdash? Shlomo. David wanted to put it up. Hashem said, it's not for you. Can't do it. So why do we say, Mizmar, Shech, and Nehazim, with David, what does David got to do with the Beis HaMikdash? And why do we say this on Hanukkah? What does that have to do with Hanukkah? Says the Medrash Rabbah, you know why we credit David HaMelech with the Beis HaMikdash? Because even though he didn't put it up, and even though he didn't even lay one stone, but the same thing we say by Moshe Rabbeinu. David HaMelech was Moshe Nefesh for the Beis HaMikdash for, to try to attain the site of the Temple Mount. Before the Beis HaMikdash was built, you could go to the Temple Mount, right? But once it's built... Right? You remember the shir from a few weeks ago? But David HaMelech was Moiser Nefesh for the Beis HaMikdash. Hashem says, if you give up of yourself for a mitzvah, I give you even more than you did, even more than you deserve, even more than you could attain. That's Mizmar Sheikh Chanukah Svay Sadavit. And this is the pattern that the Bach highlights to us of what we should understand and think about on Chanukah. And that is the Avera, the Jewish people, where we slackened off. And unfortunately, the, that pattern brings you, Rebbe says, you're slacking off, you're lazy, you don't do it properly, don't do me any favors, I'll take it away from you. That's, that's, the, side of, that's the side of bad. But on the flip side, let's add our toys. If a person puts in genuine effort to try to do a mitzvah, Rebbe Shem says, oh, I see the mitzvahs are important to you, you value it, then not only will I help you do the mitzvah, I will give you heavenly assistance. I will give you siyata deshmaya. I will miraculously give you opportunities that it was not, not even within your capabilities to fulfill. And this is something that when you see in Mertz Hashem, it's coming Tuesday night, when you light the, the Neros of Hanukkah, you should use it as an opportunity to think that if we do our part and we have the Ratzon, we have the genuine desire, the Yvon Shem will perform miracles for us Bayom and Mahim, Uvizman Azat, thank you for You've just experienced another Torah class brought to you by TorahAnytime.com.